Hello, everyone. I hope you all had an enjoyable weekend. Uh, I have some brief announcements for you today. Uh, just that now we have 760 sites in retail locations in 45 states, plus the District of Columbia. Uh, CVS is planning to open an additional 650 sites. So these are encouraging numbers. It's, again, a testament to our private sector uh, for all that they've done in partnering with the administration and helping to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Um, also, skilled nursing facilities, there was an announcement that I just want to underscore that $4.9 billion in additional relief funds were distributed to nursing homes and other skilled nursing facilities, and these funds are provided under the CARES Act. So just those two items for you this morning, and we'll go ahead and we'll start with questions. John. Um, China is making uh, more, uh, sending more overtures that it will crack down on Hong Kong. What's the message from the administration? to the Chinese government about changing the special status of Hong Kong. Yeah, and I know, Jen, uh, you also emailed a question about this this morning. So I went directly to the president um, to get an answer on this. And he said to me uh, that he's displeased with China's efforts and that it's hard to see how Hong Kong can remain a financial hub if China takes over. So that's which, which means what? Would the United States change its relationship with Hong Kong? So I have no further announcements as to the precise action that the president will be taking, but he did want me to share that with you this morning, this afternoon, I should say. Yes. Oh, thanks again. Yep, sure. no problem. Just over my shoulder, I realize now. Um, we saw a lot of images over the Memorial Day weekend of people gathering in large crowds, not maintaining social distancing. Those images uh, for the Lake of the Ozars in Missouri was one example we saw all over television news. Does the president have any concerns about those kinds of gatherings? We haven't heard any message from him addressing that specifically. Well, the president, as he's noted, he wants to see society reopen, wants to see the economy reopen, but we do want to do so safely. And there are uh, institutions that have put into place these social distancing measures, and people are making it cognizant, a part of their everyday lives. For me, for example, I went to mass this weekend, and people were socially distanced. They were washing their hands. There are ways to do this, and the president would underscore to everyone that we should be taking into account these measures. So yes, everyone, while you go out, let's keep cognizant the recommendations of the CDC, because those um, in the end are very important to making sure that there is no spread of the virus. And I would just also note one point. Um, I did have some updated numbers for you on reopening and what we're seeing across the country that I think are important, um, that 42 states are now under 10 percent in their positivity rate for the virus. Um, mortality is now equivalent to what we saw at the end of March. That's the lowest level in two months. So we are seeing these encouraging signs as we start to reopen. Anyone else? Jeff. Uh, you know, the president tweeted or retweeted something uh, which seemed to be criticizing Joe Biden for uh, wearing a mask over the weekend. Was that his intention? And if it was, why would he criticize that? I think, look, you know, the president's excited to see that Joe emerged from the basement. Um, it, it is a bit peculiar, though, that in his basement right next to his wife, he's not wearing a mask, but he's wearing one um, outdoors when he's socially distant. So I think that there was a discrepancy there. Uh, he's not shaming anyone. As the president noted himself, he wore this mask in private. Um, at the Ford facility, and he said he's open to it if the circumstance mandates it. Is the guidance to wear a mask when you're outside, though, not when you're necessarily in The guidance home? is it's, it's recommended but not required. So it's the personal choice of the individual, but it didn't strike him as a very data-driven decision in that particular incident. Yes, Peter? Thanks. If we could just do a little housekeeping first. We know Katie Miller tweeted that she's back at work today. Is the White House LA back at work, and has anybody else within the White House complex tested positive for the virus besides those two individuals that we learned about a couple weeks ago? So I don't know about the valet. I haven't inquired about that. Um, no updates as to uh, who's tested positive or not. That's not something I regularly keep tabs on. But Katie Miller is back at work. We're very happy to see her recovered. I spoke to her yesterday. I haven't seen her today, but she did have several negative test results before she reentered the building. Would you get back to us and let us know if anybody else, people are worried about the president's safety, the vice president's, can you let us know that nobody else has tested positive in the two plus weeks that have now passed since those cases? I can inquire about it, but it's people's personal medical decisions, so I'm not entirely sure that that would be given to me. Okay, let me follow up then if I can. The president, uh, in a tweet earlier today, said that he's made uh, governors look very good by getting them what he said was unlimited testing. That's not true. You've said 
that it's not even necessary. So why is the president saying that? He's saying what he means by that is that the governor's requested a specific amount of testing to reopen, and he indeed has provided that. So uh, not that's not testing, you would agree. It, it's what they asked for in phase one. It's the full panoply of what every governor asked for that was given to him, uh, given to them. Um, and it's 300 to 400,000 tests per day that we're doing. That's a really good number. I did um, talk to Admiral Joie before coming out here. And the metric that appear to believe the WHO, I don't particularly these days, but they say it's a, a good barometer of testing is 10% positivity or under. Um, and Admiral Joie shared with me that we're nationally at 7.5%. So we're in a, a pretty good spot. Is Stephen Miller back? Is Miller back? Yes, I just saw him on an outer oval, so he is back and at work. Did he take some, some time away from the White House, though, for a while? He did. Yeah. He did. He self-quarantined um, with his wife, but they're both back at work and healthy and happy, and we're very happy to see them around. On Glenn Fine um, at the Pentagon, the, the top watchdog over at, at the Pentagon, he submitted his resignation today. Can you say if that was encouraged? Did anyone ask him? And can you talk about the importance about those um, internal watchdogs that are in our government agencies? So you said it was Glenn Fine. That was, that's the first that I'm hearing about this. But with regard to the other IGs, um, I would note that the president's within his authority, um, his legal and executive authority to appoint new IGs. And he said, uh, I think last week at some point, that it's within the decision making process um, of each entity, the State Department, each department, whether to keep their IG or not. Um, and I would note that President Obama uh, has a precedent of firing IGs as well. Um, and there were, in fact, 47 IGs that signed a letter claiming the Obama administration hindered their efforts. So there, this is not without precedent um, when it comes to IGs. Yes. Kelly, is it the President's position that the Republican uh, National Convention should go forward no matter what, no matter what the uh, COVID infection rate is uh, by late August? The President wants to see the convention take place. Um, he's noted that. And he wants to have a cooperative governor in making that uh, pursuit happen. Uh, that being said, of course, we always assess the facts on the ground at any time. But at this moment, the President wants to see this convention take place and sees no reason not to as the nation begins to reopen. So if there was a significant spike in the cases, he would be open to the idea of a virtual convention and understanding that there couldn't be a uh, a traditional convention. So I won't engage on a hypothetical as to where the cases will be, but I would just note that we assess the facts on a day-by-day -day basis, and currently we're coming down, um, and that's really encouraging to see, and we're ready for the convention to take place. Yes. Yes, has the president seen the letter that Laura Klausovic's uh, husband, widower, sent uh, to Jack Dorsey, Twitter CEO, saying that his tweets were emotionally traumatic for him and for uh, his ex his wife's family? I don't know if he's seen the letter, um, but I do know that our hearts are with Lori's family at this time. Why is the president making these unfounded allegations? I mean, this is this is pretty nuts, isn't it? Uh, the president's accusing somebody of, of possible murder. The family is pleading with the president to, to please stop uh, unfounded conspiracy theories. Why is he doing it? Well, you know, I would note that the president said this morning that this is not an original Trump thought, um, and it is not. In fact, 2003 on Don Imus's show, it was Don Imus and Joe Scarborough that joked about killing an intern, joked and laughed about it. So uh, that was, I'm sure, pretty hurtful to Lori's family. And Joe Scarborough himself brought this up with Don Imus, and Joe Scarborough well, himself can president, answer it. He's the president of the United States, and he's accusing somebody of possibly murder. I mean, this is different. He's, he's, he's not a private citizen. He's the president. Yeah, and Joe Scarborough, if we want to start talking about false accusations, we have quite a few we can go through about Mika no, I'm asserting asking, I'm asking about the Mika Brzezinski. I'm asking about the president's allegation. And, I, and uh, I'm uh, replying to you and saying this morning, as recently, I believe it was this morning or yesterday, Mika accused the president of being responsible for 100,000 deaths in this country. That's incredibly irresponsible. They've dragged his family through the mud. They've made false accusations that I won't go through, that I would not say from this podium against the president of the United States. And they should be held to account for their falsehoods Joe Scarborough should be held to account for saying people will die by taking hydroxychloroquine. Never mind the millions of Americans and people across the world who take it for rheumatoid arth arthritis and other reasons. There are a litany of false is, headlines is that like Mika. The president spreading a false uh, conspiracy theory that suggests I would that point he's you back responsible to, for murder? I would point you back to Joe Scarborough, who laughed and joked about this item on Don Imus' show. It's Joe Scarborough that has to answer these questions. So Stephen. Stephen. Thank you. I, if I could, two questions. Um, uh, John Radcliffe was sworn in as intelligence director today. Has the president decided um, 
what ne what's next for Rick Grinnell in terms of an appointment? He hasn't, but Rick Grinnell is a very valued uh, member of this administration. He's done extraordinary work at ODNI. He has a great history. Um, we'll see where he goes next, but just um, know that Rick Grinnell has done an excellent job in that position. I expect that John Radcliffe will um, as he takes over. And my second question, if I could. Um, I asked the president uh, last week on Capitol Hill about his involvement with FISA reform. And obviously, it's, uh, FISA is something he cares a lot about. Uh, but he told me that he had left it up to the senators to figure out. And um, you know, it's still ongoing, this process. The House has to pass the legislation that the Senate passed. The Senate, senators tried and failed by just one vote to uh, ban the worthless collection of internet records. So I'm wondering uh, how the pre if you could uh, describe a little more how the president sees himself as part of this debate and whether he might intervened at some point going forward. Yeah, it's very personal to the president when it comes with FI comes to FISA. Uh, this is an important tool in the intelligence community. He knows that, but he also knows that it was used and abused and politicized. Um, the fact that you had 29 members um, of the Obama administration, there are 29 individuals of the intel community and Obama administration unmasking dozens of times, using these tools that are, are so much power to spy on an American citizen, to listen to their phone calls, to unmask their names. We have a Fourth Amendment in this country. It protects the rights of Americans, but the rights were not protected when it came to President Trump and his administration and Michael Flynn, whose name was leaked in a criminal fashion to the press. FISA was not used appropriately when a steel dossier full of lies that was, quote, salacious and unverified in the words of Jim Comey was used as the basis to get a FISA warrant and, and, and attested to as if it were truthful and a reason to spy on Carter Page. These tools were used and abused. The Fourth Amendment rights of several Americans were violated. A political campaign was spied upon. So any FISA concerns the president has, they're real, they're personal, and they should be considered as we move forward to reauthorize this valuable Can tool. Yeah. Sure. Uh, if I could, uh, Rick Grinnell is one of his last official acts at the request of Adam Schiff declassified transcripts of the phone calls between General Michael Flynn and Sergei Kislyak. Would President Trump encourage John Ratcliffe to facilitate the release of those transcripts? I haven't spoken to him on that, but this president has um, released, uh, not the president rather, but this president has overseen an ODNI that has given the American people a lot of information that I think they're entitled to see. And one of the things the president has asked for is where are the 302s, the summaries of that interview with Michael Flynn? Um, 302s, so the American people understand, these are summaries when you interview an individual, and it's routine that those 302s are given in short order right after the interview is done. It's when your memory is at its best. But in the case of Michael Flynn, those 302s were lost and, in fact, edited afterwards by corrupt Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. Uh, so there's a lot of questions, and this president has encouraged transparency on this issue, and so, I think it's so, a great thing. So in the absence of the 302s, would he encourage the release of the transcripts so that the American people can see exactly what transpired during this conversation? I haven't asked him that. I'd have to ask him that particular question. Yes. yes, let me uh, let me get a few people in the back because I want to make sure equal opportunity question uh, caller. So yes, Kim, uh, we're about to cross the hundred thousand uh, dead American uh, milestone. What would what does the White House view as having by election day? What does the White House view as the number of dead Americans um, where you can say that you successfully defeated this pandemic? Is there a number? Yeah, you know, every loss of life counts. We say 100,000, but like the president says, you know, one death is something to be mourned. Um, these 100,000 individuals have a face. The president takes this very seriously. It's why he lowered um, the flag to half staff for three days to remember these men and women. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Burks um, said it best when she said that um, in their estimates, they had anywhere between 1.5 and 2.2 million people in the U.S. succumbing to the virus if we didn't shut down the economy. The president made the very hard choice of shutting down the economy, so we avoided that extraordinary number. Um, every one death is too many. We never want to see a single individual lose their life. Um, but that being said, to be under significantly that high mark um, shows that the president did everything in his power and helped to make this number as low as humanly possible. When voters go to the polls in November and they want to judge the president on his response to this pandemic, what is the number of dead Americans that they should? tolerate as ha and where they can argue that yes he successfully defeated the pandemic i think um you know you're asking the wrong question the right question is where did where did That's the, the data 
ask Haley. So please don't tell Where me did, that I'm asking a right And I answered your question once, but if you ask it twice, it doesn't make it any better of a question. So I'll respond in kind. I've given you one answer. I'll continue to extrapolate upon that, that he always listened to the science. The president, when Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burke said, you need to shut down the economy. That was hard for the president. You know, in a typical year, 120,000 people die of suicide and drug overdose. It's in a typical year. And doctors have said, uh, when you shut down an economy for an extended period of time, that number gets greater. People don't show up for their cancer diagnosis. Uh, there are a litany of, of results when you close down an economy, but closing down the economy for this amount of time kept us far below the 2.2 million number. And as we start to reopen, we keep in mind the people who are missing their screening appointments, the people um, who are not, who are succumbing to suicide and drug overdose because of economic hardship. This president made the right choice. Uh, it was a delicate balance, and he did it exactly as he should, guided by data. And we are far below 2.2 million dead Americans because of the actions of President Is Trump. You mean? I'm going to read something really quickly. Timothy Claw Sotis wrote, quote, conspiracy theorists, including most recently the President of the United States, continue to spread their vile and misinformation on the platform, disparaging the memory of my wife. Why won't the President give this widower peace and stop tweeting about this conspiracy theory involving his wife. Why I've, won't why can't this widow get peace from the president? I've already asked and answered this question yeah, and our hearts are our hearts are with question. our hearts are with Lori and I think uh, the onus is on Joe Scarborough to explain yeah, his interaction with Don Imus and his laughing the on this very matter on Don, Don Imus's show. The, the Chanel. Winner, the winner, excuse me, the winner is talking specifically about the president. Are you not gonna answer that? Lawrence, um, with regards to ex CIA chief John Brennan. How far, how willing are you able to go forward and say that he lied to the FBI or obstructed justice in the process of discussing Russian collusion and the Trump family? And on that note, you, we now have new information showing that, that Obama himself used foreign intelligence to actually request surveillance on the 5th and 26th floor of the Trump Tower. So to what extent was John Brennan behind that? To what extent can you share with, with, with us what you know? Yeah, John Brennan, of all of the, uh, I'd, I'll call them bad actors, because indeed they were, um, of the Obama administration, John Brennan probably has the most to answer, because it was John Brennan who sat before Congress and said the Steele dossier, paid for by Hillary Clinton, paid for by the DNC, that that document played no part of the role in opening the Russia probe, when in fact we know it did, when in fact we know it was the impetus um, a testified before a FISA court for its truthfulness to spy on, on the Trump campaign. So John Brennan, of all people, probably has more to answer. Uh, so too do Samantha Power uh, and Susan Rice um, and these individuals who admitted under oath uh, that they, in fact, um, spoke to foreign leaders and uh, representatives of foreign leaders during their transition, but yet somehow during the Trump transition that was uncalled for. What has been done um, all throughout history was uncalled for and meriting unmasking and meriting uh, cornering General Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. All of these people have really legitimate questions to answer. I think we're slowly getting to the bottom of this, but it, it's a real travesty and really one of the biggest political scandals in modern history. Yes. Thank you, uh, it's about the, the G7 summit. Um, so the, the area still has a very high number of cases. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau spoke yesterday with uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Macron. Uh, is the President still confident of being able to uh, organize the event in like three weeks? It would be three weeks from now if we yeah. stick to the date. Yeah, it's a really great question and an important one um, because the G7, the president, wants to see this take place as America reopens, as we try to approach a place of normalcy where people go back to work, where people um, do recreational activities but socially distance while they do it. The president thinks no greater example of reopening um, in this transition to greatness would be the G7 and the G7 happening here um, and happening probably more towards the end of June. Um, Robert O'Brien, I believe it was, was asked about this this weekend and Robert O'Brien said that he's getting a great um, reception from world leaders who are asked about coming. We will protect world leaders who come here just like we protect people in the White House. Um, so we want to see it happen. We think it will happen. And so far, foreign leaders are very much on board with the idea. Last week of June and here in D.C. or at Camp David? I don't know if it'll be the last week of June, but towards the end of June. And the goal for is it is for it to be here at the White House. Yes. Right. So after the lowering of the flags this past weekend, does the president have any other plans in the works to, to honor the victims of, of, the, of the virus? Yeah, I think and, he's kind of, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And, and a larger question is, does he 
uh, see his role as martyr in chief in some way, which would be the traditional role of president. Yeah, I think he takes that, that responsibility very seriously. Um, he said that this is the hardest part of his presidency going through this pandemic. Um, he says so many times that he thinks about um, many of his friends, some of his friends, I should say, who have perished because of this disease. It's real to him. It's personal to him. It's why he says, um, you know, one death is too many, and he thinks about it all of the time. So he does see his role as that, comforting the nation, um, but reopening the country, giving the country hope at this time as we look um, forward to going back to work and resuming our lives, um, although in a new reality with new CDC guidelines. Reactions in the works? I think lowering the flags is a great example, and we have further announcements on that front. I will be sure to share those with you. Yep. Jen. Thanks. So going back to the Clostutis family, I think is how you pronounce it, the Florida family, they have asked the president, the, the widower has asked the president in that letter to, to stop um, talking about this and for Twitter to take down those tweets. I just wanted to ask you, is the president asking for someone for law enforcement to reopen this cold case? Is that what he's intending? Is he going to ask the DOJ to reopen something? What is he asking for when he talks about the cold case? Yeah, I don't have any future announcements on the president's action, but I would just refer everyone, um, for those of you who haven't heard it, go back and listen to the Don Imus soundbite. It was very callous. It was very cruel. Um, and I think laughing and joking um, about the death of an intern is really uncalled for. And I think that's something we can all agree to. Thank you all very much. Just for clarity, is the president going to stop, Kaylee? Just for clarity. For clarity.